I'm Adam, that's not that's just for anybody who's um, needs the help. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people out here, not only just for, for, the, for the, our series, but also to hear Sana as well. Um, meeting Sana, when I met Sana for the first time, it reminded me how small the world is because um, I came to Sana in, uh, through the process of working on a book uh, that is telling the story of three different Syrian uh, refugees from three different generations um, and was missing one generation um, to, to put this together and I contacted um, some of the people at Scholars at Risk asking me to help put me in touch with people. A woman named who works her name Serena, who was about 24 years old, um, was at a party in New York with other 24-year-olds, and she called me and said, "I met somebody whose boyfriend is the cousin of somebody else, who blah 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 blah." And anyway, here's Sana's this woman Sana's email. She's in Europe, but maybe you can get in touch with her. So I wrote to Sana, and Sana wrote me back and said, "It is so great to reconnect with Roger Williams, and it's such a home." And I had no idea what Sana was was talking about, and then Kate Green wrote me and said, I hear that you are talking to Sana, and I, had no, I really had no clue as to, as to how this was all connecting up. Well, it turns out that, the, um, I don't want to say Sana's story, but this chapter in Sana's story, that, of which she's sort of in the middle of, or sort of coming out of, um, started here at Roger Williams University um, when she was in the MEPI program, which is the Middle East Partner Initiative, which is a six-week leadership program that the university um, works with in conjunction with the State Department. So the objective for today is I'm going to kick off asking Sana a few questions, um, get the um, conversation going, much like we did six months ago or something, uh, except we did it over three and a half, four hours, so we're going to do it in about a half an hour this time. Um, and then we'll open the floor up for questions that any of you might have um, as well. So from what I said, let's start with first when this part of your story started. You were here. You were, this was, what, 2013 in July, is that right? Um, is that working? Oh, it's working. Um, first of all, I really would like to thank you all for having me here, for Roger William University, the library, Adam, <coughs> Kate, and everyone who worked on bringing me here, uh, because I really deeply appreciate anyone who gives me the platform to speak up about something that not only changed my life, but the lives of millions, and it's still... Uh, doing this. So really thank you for having me here. And as um, Adam said, it all started here actually in Roger William University. And um, that was on actually July 2nd, 2013. Um, I was here, um, I just came from Syria like a week before, the, towards the end of June, uh, to be part of a program at Roger William University um, called uh, Middle East Partnership Initiative Program, and it's basically a program that trains students from Middle East and North Africa about leadership skills and civic engagement. So, you know, it's a, for us coming from that region, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to come here on like two months training. The U.S. It was like a very far dream; we would never even think about it. So it happened, and uh, that was during that Syrian Revolution. So the war was still was was happening and still. Um, and my dad said, yeah, you know, it's very needed skills that you're going to learn. It's about, you know, the leadership and civic engagement with so much need in Syria, considering the time that we're going through. So he was very encouraging of me coming here for these two months and hopefully going back home and uh, finishing my school and, you know, just continuing my, our activism against the government. However, um, what I came for two months has turned for three years now. And uh, what happened basically that um, on July 2nd, just a week after my arrival and after I started the program, um, I just go to class. <laughs> and we uh, remember that day we were meant to meet with the um, mayor or something from... Uh, yeah, the governor. We were, uh, as a students, we were meant to meet with, with him. And but <laughs> her, sorry. Gender doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we were meant to meet with them, and on that day, so we had the morning session there. It was like, you know, dress up because we're going to meet with the governor. And then I, you know, wake up in the morning, go to class here in the building, history building. Yes, in that building. <laughs> um, and then in the class, we're having the session, 
and I have, you know, we all have our phones next to us. Um, sorry for that. But I had my phone next to me, and then I received a Facebook message from my sister in Arabic, literally saying, saying our dad got detained. And that was the message. I was in the class, and I just opened my phone, and I read this message. And I kind of, like, don't really remember what happened next. I was, um, I mean, it was very, um, I don't know even how to word this. But it was very big. Um, I just could not believe it. And, it, and like, I know it's going to happen. Like, it was not something like, oh, happened out of nowhere. I think my dad has always been an activist, so it's something expected. But still, it was so shocking. And the f it's just, I, I collapsed, like I think anyone else would do. And um, I was in the class, and they took me out of the class, Dr. Barbara and Kate. And I just, you know, I had my own moments here in that building, just trying to, um, I was I, I was like just crying all the time and I did not understand what happened, but I was, I couldn't even process this because I had like, you know, to, to act up in what I just heard. So for example, I had immediately to contact a friend in, this, in the US saying, please, like he's a cybersecurity expert. So I was like, please, can you deactivate all my dad's social media like and emails and stuff so the government doesn't have access to his activism? I had to think immediately about my dad's, like what he asked us to do when he gets detained. Um, so that, I mean, you know, I went, like I started doing this with support like of Kate and Parba and like, you know, started doing the calls and crying and talking with the person and saying what to do, what to not to do and remembering all the passwords and usernames and not being able to be in touch with my family then when, when my dad got detained. And, you know, I had, uh, you know, I had a very tough time here um, continuing in the program, I think, for a few days after what happened. And um, due to his detention, so my mom and my other two sisters who were in Turkey when, when that happened, who were in Syria, sorry, when that happened, um, they had immediately to smuggle also to Turkey, fearing for their lives. Because the way it works in Syria, when someone in the family gets detained, the other family members get detained um, to put pressure on the men. And especially women, you know, they get used as political weapon. So we had no options. My mom and my other two sisters, 13 years old and 23 years old at that time, had literally to, to leave everything. Everything. When I say everything, I mean everything. And just walk and take all kind of, you know, different transportation, going through different checkpoints, uh, bribing people, smugglers, to, to reach Turkey safe, um, safely. That's all they did. And I lost connection with them doing this because it was um, over a 17 hours trip, uh, uh, hour trip, and I couldn't be in touch with them. So like, I'm here in the US, and they are, we don't, I don't know where, like, just lost connection. My dad also lost connection, got detained, and I was here. You know, I just um, f lived so many moments of frustration, of anger. Um, I mean, it was beyond sadness, I think. Um, that's why I was here. Um, I, it, I had a very tough time, um, I, mean, I think, you know, the first few days. But somehow, I was able to continue the program. I was able to continue, and I think, like, I did kind of well, did I? <laughs> uh, and... Um, I mean, I now I look at pictures we take. We took at, that, at the program after the event of my dad's detention, and I still see the, see the pictures, and I was like smiling, and I say like, "Oh my God, how did I do it?" Um, and um, I know, but it just happens. But you know, I had you know still like another. I think that's when the chapter started. I would say in Roger William University here, and I walked so much on this campus, crying and trying to you know using the Wi-Fi, trying to connect to my family in Syria. Um, but I should say I, I received so much um, social support when I was here. Well, let's go back before that. Yeah. And before I forget it, Bob McKenna is right in my line of view. For the students who are justice study students, um, you can sign in with various faculty. Okay, there's a per petition search. Go ahead. So coming back before you got here, you just said that coming here was sort of a, an opportunity of a mm -hmm. lifetime. Sure. Right? What was your life before? I remember, so I know, for example, you were very active in, in uh, the politics, you know, mm -hmm. as a student activist yes. in, uh, in Syria. You've even, you've even told me it was sort of maybe one of the greatest moments of your life, you know, Definitely. period of your life. Can you talk about what, what life was like for you then? What, you know, especially for people who may not even be as familiar with, with, mm -hmm. with what you would have been an activist for um, and so on? 
I mean, um, I come from a very political family even before the revolution broke out in Syria in 2011. So my family has always, especially my dad and uncles, had always been activists, um, speaking up against the government, human rights activists. And this is, this is something so abnormal in our um, region uh, because we have such dictators, regimes, and this is like, we don't have freedom of, or political spe um, freedom of speech, for example. So I grew up in a very, um, political and globally aware home uh, where I was, you know, I, I had the chance gladly through my dad's uh, attention to learn about so many things and conflicts and topics ha happening all around the world. I come from a very small village in Syria. I could like be brought up, brought up differently, but gratefully because of my parents, I was, I was more of a global um, citizen even when I was in Syria. So when the revolution started in 2011, um, it's so easy. My family, my dad, my my other sister, and myself were, were literally from the first people to be in the streets, not only demonstrating but organizing demonstrations and protests against the government. Damascus. That was in Damascus. I mean, my sister and I, our activism was based in Damascus because we left our town um, to study in university, and the university is in the capital. So we moved from the village to university to study. Um, so our activism was measured there. However, my dad's activism was measured in our um, in our village you know, and our town. And I mean, definitely he had things to do in Damascus as well. It's the capital. Everyone tried to do things in the capital. But he was very active in our community back there. So, you know, we we protested, we demonstrated, we did any any. Um, any type of nonviolent activism you would imagine, you know, distributing flyers, trying to raise awareness about fr what freedom means, how the regime is trying to manipulate us. Um, and it's very, very risky to do this in Syria. As a result of all of this, um, my sister and I got detained uh, by the Assad regime intelligence in 2011, September. So after six months of the revolution uh, had started then. And um, I mean, gladly, we, I was released a few days later, my sister the same. We were detained with another group of friends um, who stayed for three, six months, and some did not make it out until now. And um, at that time, I had detention experience that's, um, you know, uh, like it's very hard, you know, I know how to, and I think this is a very, um, I know how you can talk about detention experience with, such regimes, it's not legal even. It was not like they come and take you to prison. It's not prison. It's a detention facility. It's an uh, integrating facility. It's investigating investigation facility where basically you get uh, integrated and beaten up and tortured and raped and harassed and everything bad you know you could imagine. Is I know maybe here when you study the Soviet Union history or you study about the intelligence from that region, I mean, if you read about their tools um, and, um, integ um, and investigating people and detention, maybe it could give you some idea about what a detainee could go through. And um, we had our own struggle in our detention, but definitely w we were from the blessed one that we were released, right? So many people. You were held in a men's prison too, weren't you? Yes, yes, there is no, um, and it's because it's not prison. It's like facility, detention facility. So it's not like there's man and woman. Um, everyone goes together. But my sister and I were the only girls in the whole thing because it was just so early in the revolution. And um, you know, it depends on the culture. Like sometimes women would not be active immediately. So yeah, we were from the first people. And at the same time, just actually, you no, know, it's uh, 10 days before our detention, our dad was detained from our village. So we got detained from Damascus, and before he got detained from the village on a different, you know, like for activism, but different, uh, different things. Um, and so my mom had three of us detained at one time. Uh, it was um, it was also a very challenging moment, I think, for my mom at that time because the community was putting a lot of guilt and pressure on her. Like we told you, you should not let your girls go out. Like we told you, you know, it's like all this pr social pressure. And my mom would say, you know, my, my daughters are not more important than other people's daughters and, and sons. And those we already have less in, in Syria from the first day in demonstration. So, I mean, after, after a few days, I said that we were released gladly. And um, my father got released also like two months later. And um, you would think, I told you once before, you would think they thought, the Syrian regime thought that this really um, deterred us or... 
um, you know, put us in limits, it actually did exactly the opposite. It's just a huge motivation to continue what you really believe in. Because before, we lived it, we heard about it, we read about it, we, we met um, political activists who were detained for 20, 30 years during the father regime. And then you leave, you, know, you literally, you, you, we lived it, you know, with all its aspects, we lived it. So, of course, I was, we were like, are you kidding? Of course we're going to continue. Now we know what, for real what we were fighting against. And we continued our activism throughout the next two years, regardless of people calling her civil war. You know, there, it was so much nonviolent activism, at least from the people side. And... Um, as I said, you know, I came here just to do the two months, then my dad got detained in 2013. Can you give us a sense how many people, what, how many students were involved in the activism in Damascus? Oh, yeah. was, was this a, a huge percentage of the university or a small vocal, was it a vocal minority? Was it a... No, it was a huge percentage. If, if you would see, like, if you go on YouTube and you would look, look up videos for demonstrations in Syria, you would see a lot of people... Um, uh, protested and demonstrated, and this is something the media did not cover very well. Of course, when actually when the, that, the, um, the revolution to, to be uh, turned to be armed, the media then focused on that on what happened. But they did not focus on then the, a year and a half on uh, of nonviolent protesting in Syria. And uh, I mean, we were student activists, and we the students actually in universities on campuses organized uh, the demonstrations and protests in Damascus that drove the regime crazy. Yeah. So you were bringing that hope with you here, yeah. right? and you were, and the idea was you were going to bring that back. Yes, of course. As I said, that was the, um, I mean, that one of the purposes and the reasons my dad said, like, encouraged me to participate. You know, we needed the skills, and we in Syria we live in a very in such a closed community, um, so we are not exposed to so many skills. When I came here, I discovered so many skills in me. I never thought I have them even, and they feel like so far away. And but because of like such training and just you know, <laughs> someone asks you, "What do you think?" It's even in our schools, universities. I went to universities there. We never we never get asked, "What do we think?" So I mean, it definitely exposed me to so many um, new aspects and uh, point of views. And I was hoping to bring that with me back home. So when you were here, you were a uh, junior. In uh, my school? At your school? I, um, I was senior. Senior, studying business, and you yeah. were, what, 20? 20, 22. 22, okay. I'm 25 now. So, okay. <laughs> I was keeping score. Yeah, if you ask. Um, so, um, <laughs> so then you're here. You're packed for, you have enough clothes for six weeks, yeah. right? One suitcase or so. Yeah. You have, you're living just off whatever the, money you had with you or the scholarship money and you can't go back right so yeah so what did you do what was your <laughs> what was your first step what was your first well um well, first of all I should ask did you did you know anybody else here besides the people you'd met in? one person yeah. one friend uh who I knew from Syria and we were together in protest and he fled managed to flee um early because he was highly wanted wanted um He's the guy I said, a cybersecurity guy. So he was highly wa wanted by the government. So he fled earlier. So he was in the U.S. and was the only person I knew, besides Dr. Barbara and Kate at that time. So, I mean, um, yeah. When when my dad got detained and after you know my family reached Turkey, so the question started like, then what's next? What 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 are my options? And um, I don't have options to to go back. Uh, the option to go back to Syria, and um, I think you know staying here was a very um, was a very tough decision to make, because um, I literally was with nothing. You know, I was with suitcase for um, summer six weeks, and I had no money because. And even when they took my dad, they took everything, and my family fled with nothing, and I had nothing on me also. So it was a very um, the two months I was during the program. It was this question like, what what's next? You know, the program is gonna end on this date. Where I'm gonna go next? And then you know, this only um, you know, Kate and Parper helped a lot. Kate gave me winter clothes, you know, <laughs> which was good, and. Um, it was a lot of support, and they, you know, linked me to people in, in, in the communities, in, and I was in D.C. I, I, I was in D.C. then, and that friend lived in D.C., so I just contacted him. I was like, you know, I'm the um, 
students leaving to the airport to go back home, like at that time, and I'm like, have no home to go back, any options, <laughs> you know? And it was literally like this. He came, you know, to the lobby and he was like, with my suitcase standing, saying to everyone goodbye, going back home. I think like this moment, I would never forget. And then like having to stay here. Um, he took me to one of his friend's couches and I managed to be there for two weeks. But then every two weeks, the question, what's next? You know, and how I'm gonna stay here. And you know, they told me I can't seek political asylum. So I started, you know, with the help of Kate and other people, see, trying to know what political asylum is and how this could be done. And and it came out to be a process of worth uh, four thousand dollars that you need um, to pay four thousand dollars to ask for protection and safety in the U.S. So. And then it literally started for a year and a half in DC. I started moving from a couch to another. So I moved over 13 couches um, among people I don't know. They never met me. I've never known them at that time. And um, By the way, these were mostly Americans, right? Americans, yeah. It wasn't through the Syrian community. Yeah, one Syrian family. And then um, I got, you know, I lived with a girl, Syrian-American girl for a little bit. But they were mostly, like, the other couches <laughs> were mostly American. And American with different backgrounds, you know, they were Jewish Christians and stuff. And how to survive, you know, I literally had nothing. And I did, I, like, I did not have anything to offer the people, also money or for rent or something. So I did um, au pair, like, for families who offered, who said, like, okay, you can't stay on our couch. I was like, you know, I want to give something in return. Can I help in anything? So, you know, there's a family I helped, like, in au pair, housekeeping, babysitting. Then um, to that friend, a Syrian friend, I was linked to an organization called Human Rights First, that helps asylee in getting pro bono lawyers to apply for asylum because I needed to be legal in this country. Um, so this asylum um, lawyer helped me in seeking asylum and through that I got a work permit. So when I got the work permit, I started uh, working in restaurants um, for all my time in, in, in DC. And you know, I, I always say I was so busy surviving all the time. Like my worry, my first worry was, um, shelter and food, like how, where I'm gonna sleep every two weeks, every month, I have this question where I'm gonna sleep next. And, but you know, throughout this process, I met amazing people who have become family for me right now, who are like huge supporters. And um, I mean, what was a very, I, I think this definitely, the whole thing since 2011, but definitely after my dad's detention and staying in the US, um, it definitely shaped who I am. Well, I have two questions to, to follow up. One is you said that you had to learn all, a lot of new skills. Mm. Thinking. So what were the things that, to be resourceful that you um, learned on the fly or maybe realized that you knew but didn't know that you knew? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was saying anything. I did not know, you know, like, you know, the bank system. Like, I, we only use cash in Syria, kind of. So I was like, what credit and debit card? Like, someone tells me, you know, and like the bus system, the metro system, um, you know, everything was new. Um, so I needed help. I needed, not like literally help, but I needed someone to guide me a little bit towards all of this stuff. And I had a great friend, so who, every time I would ask her something, she would say, go look it up. Like, it's all online, you know? You, you don't need to depend on anyone. Like, and I literally, I mean, Google has become my, my best friend, translation, and, you know, and everything. So even the asylum process, I start learning about it online. You know, it's everything, actually, it's out there online. And I start reading about it. And meanwhile, your mother and your two sisters, your, your old, older sister, right? Just like one younger, one older. Right, one, and your older sister's not that much older than you. Yeah, a year. A year, and your younger sister was, what, about 12 or 13 at that time? Nine years younger, yeah. What did you know of what was going on with them? You're here trying to survive day to day. They're in a border in Turkey day to day. day, to day. Also. And, and what did you understand of their life and how much um, communication with them? I mean, it was also very, um, they had their own struggle. They were going through their own struggle, and the three of them also. And Turkey, the U.S. being here actually was much better than you know, being there, regardless, like, of the hardship. I mean, it has, you know, downside and good side. Maybe there they have more community. Um, there are so many other Syrian refugees. Um, I was the only one at that time. And um, so definitely they had their own struggle. They did not have a place to stay. So they stayed, they found, they managed to find um, old friends of the family. They stayed with for a little bit. Then my older sister started working um, over 16 hours a day. To, to be able to like support financially my mom and my younger sister. 
and they, you know, until now they live in a like small studio in southern Turkey. And um, my 16 years old sister now was 13 when she fled. Uh, she has not gone to school in two years. There is no education, and um, my mom just trying to survive. Also, she works in an orphanage uh, for Syrian kids. So I, I think and that's I mean that's amazing, but that's a lot of mental and emotional work for her that she doesn't really need <laughs> to go through. Um, and she, you know, in addition to health problems and you know dealing with my dad's absence and not knowing anything about him and her family and fleeing. Like my mom, just an um, um, average Syrian woman, never really left Syria before. Um, so it, it definitely, like they had very, a very huge struggle. They still go through. And my older sister, um, she's a journalist, so she was working as a journalist during that time. She reports in Syria. I mean, she's a very, she's a great journalist, I must say. <laughs> but I mean, finally, five months ago, she managed to flee to Germany. So, but alone. Um, so gladly, she managed to flee to Germany, and she's now in Germany, um, refugee. But my mom and my other sister in Turkey. And I really would like here to talk about, like, a little bit about the um, situation of refugees in Turkey. Um, it's not what you see on the news, you know. <laughs> Turkey makes headlines about, like, being very supportive and great with refugees. They are not. And it's, there's a lot of discrimination against refugees. And being a Syrian refugee in Turkey is the worst could happen to you. You, you know, like, if you want to travel, for example, between Rhode Island and Boston, as a Syrian refugee, you need a travel permit from the government to travel in a bus, take a bus, with, with inter, inter, to travel in, internally within Turkey. And now, actually, my family was trying to come to the United States. Um, and you can come through a settlement program um, with the United Nations. And my family, it's a very long bureaucratic process. It's like they have been registered for three years now. They had gone through interviews. And um, their last interview was supposed to be on July 29, just two months ago. And then they were supposed to be resettled here to the US to be reunited with me. And then that interview two days before it gets canceled. And this is, doesn't happen because it takes them a year to reschedule the, the, to schedule the interview. And so I, you know, I was talked with Fox in the State Department. I was like, you know, what's happening? Like, can, can you give us any explanation? They did not tell my mom anything. And he literally um, sent me what's written on our file like my family case file coming here. And it literally says that the Turkish government would not issue exit permits to Syrian refugees who have secondary education, like my 50 years old mom. I mean, that's, they are banned from traveling because my mom has education. They wanna keep the educated one, I think. And so like after years of working on it from the US side, then we got Turkey banning them from traveling because my mom has edu secondary education. So your sister That's really did have to escape. Yes, yes. And I cannot go there also. So they can't leave. And then they imposed visa on Syrians to come to Turkey. And they, like, I applied, of course, and they would not give it to us. So, you know, we can't go, they can't leave. So speaking of education, you realized that you needed yes. to continue your education to get out of this of this pattern. And so... You ended up at Bard, but how did you, you want to talk about how you ended up, um, again, still in the process of seeking the political asylum, no, no, not really much money to your pocket, um, and you end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after a year and a half being in D.C., I was granted political asylum. It's a very long process. I'm not going to go through it, but um, gladly, finally, I was granted one, and then the question was, what's next? Do I want to spend my life working in a restaurant? Um, or babysitting. I knew I had more skills than this. And I, like, my family, like any other family, I think, values so much education. So I knew that my only way to make it out of that bubble is to pursue education. So I started looking for scholarships um, online. Everything I did online. And uh, I came across an institution called um, the Institute for International Education, IIE. And basically, they had a, like a, a survey for, um, st they say, student, um, uh, rescued student um, to apply, and then they would match you uh, if, you're, if you have a good uh, like application with uh, one of the universities in the US. And I got matched with Bard, and they gave me full scholarship to come and continue my education. So I'm finishing in two months, actually, uh, in political science. So, but um, I mean, 
of course, the education importance sounds a little bit cliche sometimes, how important education is, but it is so important. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough that you would have not seen me here if it was not for the school and being able to continue my education. My English would have not been, I mean, it's not perfect yet, I know, but, you know, would have not been good enough to tell you what, what happened. Um, I would have not been able to speak up, to meet so many amazing people, to leave that bu bubble, to help my sister get education in Germany, to help my family financially now or anything. It would have not been possible without education. And here comes the importance of institutions in the U.S. providing education for um, Syrian refugees here. And something I know that you're dedicated to trying to help. Of course. It's my other Syrian. My mission. Yes. I have two more questions, and I'll open up the floor. Um, one, the, the, uh, the first question is, at that point, things are looking positive for you. I mean, it, given the situation, you're... You're settled down a little bit. You're getting your education, but you're also still seeing the struggle that that um, that other people, mm -hmm. either in Syria, you're going through, your own family is going through. You still have no word of your father. Well, even now you don't, but it, certainly at that point. And uh, you talked a little bit about some some, some guilt that you felt um, uh, about that, about about actually yes, making I, something for you know making this this life for mm -hmm. yourself while the rest of the. I mean, yes. I'm definitely privileged to be here, right? I mean, I thought at that time I was stuck in the US and I think I'm not stuck. I was really lucky. I was blessed to be here when that happened because being here empowered me to, to do something for my family, to other, to other Syrian refugees, to the country and to myself. So, but you know, that made me definitely every night I just feel sometimes guilty because we are in the one family um, not receiving the same thing. You know, I've told you my sister has not gone to school in three years, and my other sister had to work two time job, uh, two jobs uh, full time, to, for two years. Also, she did not go to school, and now she moved to fled to Germany, and you know, my mom going through her own struggle, and the other not talking about the extended family and the serious situation. It comes with a lot of guilt sometimes, and and feeling um, paralyzed. And sometimes I just say, like, what, how can I help? Like, what can I do from here? And I, I come to know that the importance of my, um, my voice, actually, just speaking up um, against what happening, against the xenophobic rhetoric in the U.S., against uh, speaking up to the importance of, printing, of bringing more Syrian refugees, of um, how really education just transforms your life after going through such a traumatic event. And on that note, which sort of leads into the, the, la the, the last question I had in my mind, was you're often described as the face of the Syrian refugee, mm -hmm. of the, or of the, the, the young student Syrian refugee, but you did express to me that you, weren't, that you didn't want to be the face mm -hmm. of the refugee. What do you want to do? Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to be the face of refugees because, you know, we are different. You know, everyone... You know, they have their own face, and I think everyone deserves the chance to, to have the platform to speak about their life, to share their life and their experience. So, and this is also puts on me a lot of responsibility because at the end, I'm just a human being, and I go through down times and depression, and I still, I still deal with a lot of what happened, right? Because it did not end. You know, it's still happening. My dad's still detained, and we don't know about anything about him. My family's still there. I'm still here. And what witnessed in Syria and lived definitely has a lot of psychological effects on me. And then when people put so much pressure on me being the face, I feel like it's a, it's a huge responsibility. I mean, if I'm able to do anything, I will do it regardless of being called what, the face or the, uh, what did I say, my, my family says the ambassador, <laughs> refugees ambassador or something. I don't want to be called any of these. I mean, because I'm just, I feel... You know, I feel I'm here. Like, what right I have to speak for it? people who like still under bombing, right? I just don't want to undermine their pain. So I'm just trying always to be aware of this. Well, um, let me open up for questions. And if you don't, I've got a million more in my head, but I don't want to monopolize this thing. Um, so if anybody has questions, I pass the mic around. Of course, this is a, you know, with there's a, well, it's funny, the, it's not funny, but the last time Son and I spoke, there was a ceasefire, and now there is a ceasefire. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, issue. There are a lot of issues going on within the country right now. But questions? Yeah. 
Sana, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that um, there are people here in Rhode Island who feel a lot of solidarity with you. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island, which, which uh, helps resettle immigrants and refugees in Rhode Island. And there are a lot of people who, who believe in the mission of that organization to help your, your countrymen <laughs> and women who are, who are here um, try to integrate into the community and find places to live and, and get education in, in English. Uh, uh, you know, we believe in the importance of education as you do. I just, so I just wanted to thank you for telling your story and to let you know that there are people here who, uh, who, who believe that anything that we can do to be of help is, is important. Well, thank you so much, and I think all of you being here, it just gives me so much hope and support. I mean, obviously, um, all of you, you, you care for being here and trying to listen. So thank you so much. Hi. So um, you mentioned a little bit how you feel some guilt um, with the fact that you're here and, and your family, unfortunately, um, hasn't been as privileged um, in finding um, safety. Do you, and um, you said that that was something that you felt, but did you feel any pressure from your family with them? You know, because I know that they're struggling a lot. So how did you deal with um, pressures coming from your family and how did you balance kind of, you know, keeping your head on straight and believing in, you know, what you were here to do and making a difference throughout all that? Um, actually, I did not have any pressure of the, from the family. It was the opposite. I was under the pressure that they are so worried about me being here. I was like, I'm, I'm doing so good, you know. And my mom was like, I can't believe, you know, for a mom, especially in that region, and then I'm a girl and moving among all these couches and, you know, in, in a U.S., you know, my mom, for it, my, in my mom's mom, mind, the U.S. is bigger than actually it is. So... It definitely was the pressure that she was always there always and still always worried about me um, living and surviving and stuff and actually it's the opposite and they were they always th she always told me and she still that you being there empowering us and that's you know we, we like we made a plan of course we, we, we were like okay I would go to school I finish a school then my older sister would go back to school so I take the family responsibility and stuff and gladly we were, we were able to do this plan because I am here my sister went to Germany and now she started school in American University Bard has a campus in Berlin and I talked with the school they offered her scholarship there and she now continuing her studies and I'm finishing in two months and like I'll be taking care of the family. So I think being here empowered us all. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, xenophobia, mm -hmm. which is a major issue happening as the campaign for president comes. Sure. And I wonder, uh, I try to find the language to tell people um, how fortunate we are to have immigrants coming to this country, that we've always had uh, a diverse population, and the more diverse we are, the better. But I wonder what, what your voice, what you, would, what you would say from your perspective. I say it as um, someone who was born in this country and who is also very privileged to be here. What would you say as a, a more recent um, arrival to this country? I mean, the xenophobic rhetoric, it's something I'm living with every day also. And I, of course, I go through incidents where people are not very happy of me being here or other Syrians. And, um, and I think I said I come to realize the importance of my voice because of that rhetoric. Actually, I've, I've been trying to share my life with people, just share my life, you know, what I just did with you, uh, with so many other people. And it, it has uh, become a very, actually, effective tool. I just figured that um, the only way to really change people's minds is to put a human face on the thing. And to say, like, you know, the six millions you read on the news, like, I'm one of them. You know, it's just seeing me. So, and then when I, when tell, when I share with these, with these people what I go through or what I what I went through and what my family goes through. You know, it's like a family, sh uh, like a friend sharing with you. So you would empathize with your friend, right? So they, be, they come to forget, like, the fact that the, the, the label above my head that I'm a refugee, and then just, like, okay, human being, you know. <laughs> and I, so I really, really come to discover that 
telling the the story and and make and putting face on on the cause it's it's the best tool to educate people on the cause thank you <laughs> I'm curious, do you think, um, is there something that you feel should have been done or could still be done by the international community? I'd really like to hear that. Yes, I mean, since the early 2011, if the US government and Obama administration has taken a different approach towards Syria, we would have not had a refugee crisis. And I would, I'm saying the US because it's the leader of the world, right? You guys, not you, like the US government decided to take this role after the Cold War. And obviously all the international community agreed on this. And so if you wanna be the leader, do it correctly. And they were not. Uh, the Obama administration, I, I believe, failed on Syria. The policy in Syria is so bad. If they had put like more limits to Assad in early when it, just, when it just happened, it would have been different. If they truly supported the people it would have been different. But there are so many political reasons for not supporting the people. For example, if, if the Syrian revolution succeeded, do you know what does that mean? That means it's gonna go to other countries in the region. People is, get, are gonna revolt against their own dictators. And US and it's other- It's not already happening. Yeah, but look at Egypt and Tunisia. It's so different than Syria. Syria, it's very important because it's geographic location next to Israel. We share borders with Israel. And we share not only borders, we have history and we have a land taken from us to Israel. If we succeeded, we want to draw land back, right? And that would initiate a war with Israel. And maybe the Palestinians would feel empowered to revolt against their own government. You know, is that the thought among the Syrian people of why the... I mean, this is one, uh, I think, explaining why S Syria has become what it is today. It has so many reasons. I think this is one of the reasons. Um, I mean, of course, as I said, um, having the... Assad regime receiving support from Russia and Iran, it's a, it's a key reason. And here it has to go back to the history between Russia and US. You know, I think the Cold War did not end it, and it's just happening right now on Syrian soil. And then you, know, you have Obama definitely wanted to make that nuclear deal with Iran. And to do this, he had to compromise Syria. You know, and they have their other interests in the region. So there are so many uh, political reasons that goes into explaining what's happening in Syria today. How do they come out of this now? What can the international community do at this point? Oh, like a uh, solution for Syria? <laughs> it's a very, um, I mean, you know, there's just have been a ceasefire. We were talking about the Americans and Russians decided on a ceasefire. Um, it's not, of course, it's not the solution. They say they want to come up with a political solution. And we also, Adam and I were talking about it. There is no political solution at this phase without military action. Like any political solution would take a military action to be implement, uh, implemented because now you have so many different groups in Syria. And it's not a civil war. Because since when the Russians are Syrians or the Iranians or Hezbollah fighters or ISIS with all different backgrounds are Syrians. So, Civil war is, the, is people from the same country killing each other. Well, now Syria is beyond this. If you don't want to call it a world war or like proxy war, just call it a war, but it's not a civil war. I am, um, this might be a, 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 a challenging question, but um, what do you say to your American peers who are not registered to vote? Well, you're not citizen enough. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I, I can't believe that. If I've never voted in my life. We don't have this right in Syria. And it's not really, we, we never had even options. You know, we ne the notion of citizenship did not really exist in Syria. And it existed, it was, the, it was systematically absent by Assad regime. And just the fact, regardless of what's happening now, just the fact that you can vote and be an active citizen in your community, this is a huge privilege. And I can't believe people do not realize how important their voice is. And then when you, I mean, when, if, if you don't wanna vote because you don't know who you're gonna vote to, for, okay, don't like both, Hillary and Trump. That's fair enough. But, do you, w w you know, there is like the best of the worst. If you don't vote, someone's gonna vote for Trump and he's gonna win. It's just, you, I, I would tell them that you are, you, you, you must voice, you, you must really vote. I hope everyone here is listening. Yes. Those of you of a certain age. Yeah, students, it's very important. Like you, you need, if you wanna be 
you know, it's part of being, of existing in this world is to take action towards it. You know, don't say, oh, I don't like politics. Well, we are, we live in a very political world and you cannot detach politics from your life. You cannot be, oh, I can't worry about the world. If you don't follow politics, politics will follow you. Thank you very sure. much. And thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for having well, me here. Question back here. So I'm gonna, while I walk it back, I'm going to ask you, we just heard here um, somebody asking, or telling you that we're, people are here to help support. When people say to you, what can we do? Mm. What can we do? I mean, the fact that you ask yourself and ask me, what can we do? It's, it's great because you reach the point that you're thinking about taking actions. So thank you for reaching that point. And um, there's so much you can do. And believe me, if you do not have anything, I, I tell you, you have something you can give and you can do. I found what I can do. I found that my voice matters. And I found that through building, you know, through education and building my future, I'm, I'm not only helping myself, I'm so much helping others. And, you know, it, I literally went, it goes from a cup of coffee with someone who got just newly resettled. Just ask them for a coffee. Just to chat with them as a regular person, regardless of them being a refugee. Don't always entitle them to the refugee status. Because it's our legal status. We did not choose it. You know, it just lives with us. And, um, you know, there's at the school, you know, you there's so much you can do. You can give scholarships for Syrian students, <laughs> for refugees. Um, as a person, you know, there, there are families got resettled in the area recently after the administration meeting their 10,000 goal. 10,000 Syrian refugee goal. If you don't know about it, like there was a 10,000 Syrian refugee goal to be met, to be resettled to the U.S. and the administration just two weeks ago met the goal. So now we have um, 10,000 Syrian refugee around the U.S. and actually they are mainly in, in, in this coast. Um, I think that's good. And um, so, you know, you reach out to uh, your organizations in your community and ask them how you can help these people. And as I said, it goes from anything, from chatting, from a cup of coffee. Like, you know, take them, teach them how um, the bank work. You know, help them like open bank account. English, it's very important. And I was telling them, I'm able to share my my life with you here because I learned English. <laughs> Someone empowered me and gave me for free English courses. You, you, if you can give any in in, in any way, if you can tutor. Um, someone who needs English, please do, because they would not be able to be productive in the community. They would not be able to pay t their taxes and work and speak up for others if they did not have the language. Mike? Hi. Um, I had two questions, actually. Um, earlier when you were talking, you talked about um, being a global citizen, um, and I feel like that message was just so powerful, um, only because so many sometimes just forget what's happening on the outside world. Can you just talk more about what the importance is to being aware of what's going on globally? And also, my second question was, what is the ultimate future for you? And like, what's your goal? Oh. I have not become so American yet to plan that further. <laughs> I literally like still keeping my Syrian things in me, some. Uh, but um, to answer your last question, um, like my, I know what I don't have an ultimate goal. I keep, of course, I spoke Arabic for a second. <laughs> of course, um, I'm aiming to continue doing anything that I could do, I could give to to help other people in the world, to give back to everyone that really helped me and helped others. This is my ultimate goal. So I will find ways, you know, based on my skills, uh, to do this thing. Um, what it is exactly, I, I don't know yet. But um, to answer your question about the global citizenship and the importance of being globally engaged, well, I lit you know, I would have not been here if I did not learn about this program, which brought me here. And how did I learn about this program? Because I was engaged in other st global stuff happening. Um, so I got to know, you know, through like some uh, groups that were focusing on uh, things in the US and Europe that, oh, there's this program that brings students, you know, somewhere in, in, in the US. And the same for you. You know, it opens, it's important for you to be globally engaged because it opens your mind. It changes your life. And because we live in the world that's very globalized. You know, you thought in the U.S. that you are detached from what's happening in the planet because it's U.S. planet, right? 
you, we're very privileged to be, actually, I don't know if it's privileged to be in such a distant geographic location. That really helps the US to be detached a little bit from what's going on in the other part of the world. Um, but as we know by now, you know, if you don't want to go for terrorism, terrorism came here, right? We, come, we live in a very globalized uh, world. So you need, you need to be as globalized as the world is to protect yourself, to protect your, chem, uh, your, 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 uh, your country, to educate yourself, basically to, um, to be part of this world. Like, do you want to be on the, you know, on the side? I don't think anyone wants to be like that. I don't want to be like that. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Well, that's probably a good place to end it. Um, sort of a good word. So, Sana, thank you for being here. I know you're going to stick around for a little bit. So, if people have questions that. And I'm going to put on some pitches. Oh, time, Kate's going to put on some pitches. Some pitches. <laughs> Hello. So, um, I'm Kate Green. I'm the director of international program development here at Roger Williams. It's great to see so many new faces, as well as so many great old faces of students and faculty and staff. Um, welcome. So um, this is actually the first official um, program in a year-long pro set of programmings around the quest for refuge, exploring not only the current uh, remarkably challenging <laughs> crisis of Syria, but also the long-term crises of Central, East, and West Africa, uh, the historical and geographically diverse crises of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and also what's happening in Latin America. So we have a number of programs that are gonna be happening here on campus, um, in this Bristol campus as well as the Providence campus uh, over the course of the coming year. And so I urge you all to keep an eye out for, for the word that gets, gets out and about in various ways from the university around these issues. Um, and immediately following this, uh, I know some of the students are going to be sticking around, but as well as anyone else who may be interested, we're going to be talking more about that question of what do we do? Um, what do we do as a Roger Williams University campus community? How can students organize? Um, and anyone who would like to stay is, is most welcome. Um, but do please keep an eye out for coming attractions around these really, really important issues. And Sana, oh my gosh, I love you. Thank you so much for coming back. <laughs> Thank you for having me.